Hello, welcome to this talk. My name is Peter McCroom, and on behalf of my colleagues Remy in New Zealand and Begonia in Spain, we'd like to present some of the research that we've been doing related to infragravity waves in harbours and specifically how we can produce some practical guidance for prediction of the amplitude of those waves inside the harbour for the use of defining operational thresholds for port operators. The structure of the presentation. So first of all, I'll, I'll start off and talking about what is the background and for gravity waves and why they are problematic within ports. Particularly, um, we're talking about frequent, certain frequency range of infragravity waves. It's not the entire range that's commonly discussed within the scientific literature, but it is a band that typically lies between 25 and 120 seconds. Uh, we'll talk about the current management solutions and then we'll go through an evaluation of the published infragravity equations. So these are equations that relate amplitude inside a harbour to the offshore conditions in the um, both gravity and infragravity space outside the harbour. And then we'll have a quick look at what the next generation of, of um, solutions might be. So um, considering the what actually is the problem um, and you know it's been well documented in various um, parts of literature here and there but I think what I'd like to do is to hand over to Captain Ashley McDonald from um, Port Taranaki in New Zealand and um, he's a marine manager there and he'll describe exactly what the problem is to, for him and his team. Managing uh, mooring operations at Port Taranaki is particularly challenging because we have the phenomena of long period waves. Uh, these waves are the waves that we can't even see and yet they have significant effect on our vessels and result in us having to exclude ships from the port for, for several days a year. Um, the ability to predict accurately the exact height uh, and the gradient of those waves uh, at each of our berths is absolutely paramount to us being able to control that risk and, and make it safe for our workers and safe for the crews of the ships uh, and be able to give us that surety, that assurance that we can keep a vessel in or whether it needs to leave the berth. This kind of um, centimetre level accuracy in prediction of when an event will start, how long it will last for, when it will finish and the exact severity of that is really, really important to us being able to do our business and do it well and do it efficiently into the future. And for gravity waves, let's talk about what they are. Um, so they're created by swell waves as they approach the shore. And then just like any wave, they get modified um, as they start interacting with the bathymetry or they reflect off shoreline structures. And that's particularly true also um, within a harbor because you often have very highly reflective walls that um, contain the harbor. And so you end up um, quite often having um, patterns of reflection and resonance. And that can um, lead to areas where you get um, amplification of, of the waves. So looking at this particular um, image here on the left hand side, we've got the typical sea and swell waves um, entering a, a port. And on the right hand side is the infragravity wave field that is underneath that same um, gravity wave field that is there. And you can see that the um, infragravity waves, they tend to slosh around inside the harbor. They're not very coherent. They're not like a nice smooth waveform. Um, and there's an awful lot of reflections and confusion going on. What we do know is that very small infragravity waves can cause problems to ships. And one of the reasons for that is that the ships are of the same scale as the wavelength of these um, long period waves. And we can illustrate that here. And in this scenario, we've got a, um, a group, a bunch of pressure sensors were deployed along a berth. The sensors are about uh, 100 meters apart and we've taken the various frequency bands there and animated them. So the, the, the plot on the right showing the waveforms moving up and down is, is actually real data and we've just joined the dots from the, the measurements. Um, and there's some pictures of ships there to show you the various scales from, from the different berths within this particular port. And so in this scenario there, berth number three for example, for that size ship, the frequency range of um, the greatest problem is 80 to 110 seconds and that's 
predominantly because we're ending up with a nice smooth water level gradient um, between the bow and the stern of the ship. And essentially the, the um, ship is responding and um, flowing um, downhill, if you like, with the waveforms as it goes through. So the clear message from this is it's actually quite important to be measuring um, and also predicting the, the frequency of interest to ship motion. And typically how we do this, um, and this is done in, in many ports, and certainly in Australia and New Zealand, um, is we make some measurements, and that will include pressure sensors, typically a pressure or radar, and a continuous measurement of the sea surface at a berth within the harbour, or multiple berths. Uh, at the same time, we're measuring the wave spectra further offshore, and we're also forecasting for that same location. We take all that data and we mash it together into a um, an equation. We come up with a statistically um, relevant um, way to replicate those the, um, the, cor the, the correlating the situation inside the harbour with the um, the wave spectra outside the harbour. And often that formula follows the um, the approximation of the um, wave energy flux. There are a range of equations that we can use to do that, and that's what we'll be talking about today, is the, what is the efficacy of those different equations. Um, regardless of how we do it, it comes out the other end, we can then, if we've got a good correlation between the inside and outside of the harbour, then if we can forecast outside of the harbour, then we can just apply that um, semi-empirical fit, if you like, to it, and then produce an, um, an op a forecast that operators can then make decisions um, regarding. Now the forecast on the right, we're showing some red lines dashed through there, and those are the typically the operational thresholds of concern. And you can see that uh, around about 10 centimeters in significant wave height for a long wave inside a harbor um, is big enough to start causing a problem at most of the ports. The other thing you notice in there is that there's a strong modulation by tide. Many ports um, and coastal regions as well, they observe a strong modulation with the long uh, infragravity waves being around twice as big at high tide as opposed to low tide. Here are the published infragravity equations that we'll be, um, that we'll be using. So essentially the, um, the first one, the method of Okihiro, applies the full analytical solution to the infragravity wave spectrum to resolve a long wave boundary condition outside the harbour. Uh, it's deployed here with further coefficients to uh, more fully describe the transformation into the berth. Here are the study locations in Spain and in New Zealand. These are ports of Gijón and port of Taranaki. The methodology involves having a wave rider buoy positioned offshore within about a kilometer of the, of the um, port entrance, measuring wave spectra every hour. And at the berth, we have a continuous measurement of pressure or water level at two hertz. Those Pressure data are shown here at how we process them. So um, essentially we're using a spectral high and low pass filter to resolve the, um, the water level fluctuations within the infragravity band of interest. Um, ship motion is at the berth is affected by waves up to around about 150 second period, um, predominantly 20 to 120 seconds. So it's quite important that we choose that same frequency band uh, for the analysis and shown here is an example of why we need to do that. For example, if we have a cutoff at 200 seconds, we have approximately twice the long significant infragravity wave heights if we have a cutoff at 120 seconds. And the reason for that is that there's quite a lot of energy um, being generated in that frequency band um, greater than 130 odd seconds. Our methodology is to take those data, um, process them, and then um, mash them up with the cotemporal offshore wave spectra and include the modulating effect of tide. We do that through optimizing the data into the um, fits with the published equations, and then we're making a comparison of the results. From Guion, these are the results in time series. The gray shaded area is the measured wave data. This is significant long wave heights and each of the colors relates to the five different equations. When we look at the scatter plot, we can see here uh, that it's um, reasonably consistent. We are picking up the main trends with most of the equations. Uh, Makum and Lara have the, the uh, least amount of scatter. And when we consider that in a QQ sense, 
um, once again, we're seeing very similar trends. Or in this scenario, the Ardwin um, um, equations have a reasonable fit as well. Looking at the same data from New Plymouth, once again, we see this very strong tidal modulation occurring and around about twice as big at high tide as opposed to low tide. Um, scatters are a bit broader than they were in Guillaume and when we look at the QQ plots, we're seeing the, um, once again, McCroom and Lara have the best fits to the um, measured data. Okihiro and Cuomo are really not providing um, guidance that would be relied on. We've got um, really not capturing the, the, the non-linearities within the, within the sea states that we're seeing. The standard accuracy metrics show the best predictors are defined with the equations of McCroom and Lara. The former is better in the bimodal sea states where the local seas and far field swells often coexist, therefore benefiting from a high pass spectral filter as the data indicate that short waves with less than eight seconds do not contribute meaningfully to the port infragravity wave climate. However, the technique of LARA is very simple to, to apply as it uses the parameters, spectral parameters that are readily available from a forecast model. Cuomo technique was more difficult to deploy because it required a full boundary spectra and did not perform as well over the full range of conditions in both New Zealand and Spain. Ardwin and Okahiro methods were not able to adequately replicate the time varying infragravity conditions for meaningful operational guidance. Based on this analysis, LARA is proposed as a generic prediction equation suitable for global use as capturing the coastal infragravity boundary conditions. Um, and getting most of the main nonlinear components of infragravity generation over the frequencies of interest. However, if spectral partitioning is available, the McComb equations can be applied for slight improvement. The results show that the semi-empirical equations do a pretty good job of replicating the infragravity wave heights within the harbour based on the offshore wave spectra. But we're using bulk statistics from that spectra and a lot of information is not being used in the transformation. So we do wonder whether we can improve that and the current research that we have underway at the moment is using some machine learning approaches to capture the full um, energy density and frequency and direction um, from the offshore spectra and then train that through a neural network to come up with our target infragravity heights within the harbour. Work to date suggests this technique has a lot of merit. Uh, we've pr finished proof of conflict concept and we're running operational models at several ports. Um, it has a lot of benefit and um, we hope to update the community on the outcomes of this very soon. Thank you very much for your time and I hope it's been useful um, from on behalf of my colleagues Remy and Begonia. Thank you.